All right, checking in with us is the famous mad data scientist, Mr. Neil Bala. Neil, welcome back on the show. Well, good to be taking off again with Sean. There we go. I like that. Pun intended. We both did a good job there. Um, I, for <laughs> those that aren't familiar with Neil, he has been on our podcast before. We will share that episode so you can get more of his story and background. Uh, but we're going to focus the conversation a little bit more on current events because uh, Neil's got some really great insights. Um, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of turmoil in the market lately, um, interest rates. And now with SVB failing, there's all kinds of new turmoil that's been introduced into the marketplace. Um, but uh, Neil uh, has extensive background, obviously, with multifamily investing um, with a portfolio that exceeds most of the guests we've had on this show. So without further ado, uh, Neil, if you wouldn't mind, I, I kind of want to start with Obviously, with the interest rates rising, multifamily operators are hurting out there, and that's all over the news right now and on every podcast. I'd like to kind of hear your take on what's causing some of these operators to be in trouble. What is it? What's going on? Sure. Um, so it's the same thing that caused us to be outrageously successful in the last three years. If you think about it, in Late starting late 2020, going all the way to about the first quarter of 2022, right? That time frame of 21 months was the single greater greatest you know success point in the history of the entire multifamily industry and and maybe other asset classes too, but specifically but definitely multifamily. We had extraordinary, insane, outrageous success. And that extraordinary, insane, outrageous success is now causing the problem. So it's not something different. So what happened is that the the big well, after COVID, right? So the first six months of 2020, not much transactions, COVID, blah blah blah, right? So the next sex next second six months, transactions are now beginning to happen because the Fed cuts in cuts interest rates, lenders start coming back into the market. So now you have all these buildings that people are buying at that point of time. Now, some of these buildings get sold the following year. Get, they get sold 12 months or 18 months later for shockingly high numbers. Mm -hmm. There's also buildings that people have bought before COVID in 2018, 2019. People like me bought buildings in 2018, 19, 20. And some of those got sold in for shocking numbers. Why? Because when money is so, so cheap that it's literally free, you the only decision that you have to make as underwriters is, can I get enough of a loan to cover the price that people are asking? The question that more and more people forgot to ask is, is this an appropriate price for this property? Because the only question began became, you know, can I underwrite with today's interest rates and some future assumptions tied to today's interest rates, whether I can afford to buy this property or not? So, for example, in Phoenix, a number of properties that got sold in the 40 to $45 million range in 2021 were then sold the following year in the 70 to $75 million range. So they wow. basically went up 80% in value in a single year. Not What happened in that year? Sure, Phoenix rent growth was strong, we get that. But the assumptions that were made, the underlying assumptions of these properties was that cap rates would stay in the same you know, belt that they were in. So these properties were all purchased under four caps. So they were purchased in the threes. And in addition to that, interest rates would stay low. So they, they, there were two assumptions made. And what if one of those two hadn't gone haywire, then things would still be in a good place. But both of those have gone haywire. So the first assumption was cap rates will stay in the threes for this kind of property. And the second assumption was interest rates would stay low. The combination of those two is responsible for us being where we are at. And let, let me just first set the stage for where are we? Okay. So 40% of all multifamily properties purchased in 2020, 2021, and 2022, those three years, 40% of all properties purchased with bridge debt, which is the overwhelming majority of all the properties, are now bleeding. Wow. And that number is likely to hit 50% before the end of the year. Now, I want to point out 
that I'm only talking about properties that syndicators purchased. I'm not talking about every property in the US. In fact, syndication is still a smaller portion of the multifamily market. There's lots of rich guys buying properties, doing 1031s, doing fixed rate debt. They want to hold stuff for 10 years. Wow, I didn't even years. realize that. That's a lot right. of people then that are purchasing outside of syndication. Wow. Yeah, so, so the syndication industry is still the minority of the entire multifamily market. So I'm talking about that bucket. I'm, some people have guessed that the syndication industry is 20% of the multifamily market. Some people think it's 30%, but certainly not 60 or 70%. So that 30% of the entire multifamily market in the United States, the overwhelming majority of everything that they bought in 2020, 2021, and 2022 was bridge debt. And 40% of it is wow. bleeding. And 50% is going to be bleeding or thereabouts. These are all approximations. So I have to put a caveat there. But it's not going to be 5% that are bleeding. I might be off by a few percent there. And that's huge because we are talking about tens of billions of dollars worth of properties that are bleeding. And that's just the beginning. But, but let that sink in, that they're bleeding. And most of them are bleeding tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in cash. So if we're, it, it, I have a couple questions regarding this, but the first one that came to mind for me that might come have come to mind for a lot of the listeners is if there, that sounds like a ticking time bomb, similar to things that have happened to the economy in the past. In other words, if we continue on this trend, do you foresee a lot of defaults on these mortgages and these properties going back to the bank? Well, I can't imagine a better time to answer that question because the events of the last 72 hours should give us part of your, the answer to your question. So we are recording this on March 14th, Tuesday. Um, four days ago, uh, a $200 billion bank, SVB or Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which is a couple of miles, you know, just like 20, 10 miles down the road from me, I live in Silicon Valley, uh, imploded. And it imploded so quickly that it actually didn't even wasn't even made, able to make an attempt to save itself, right? So it, there was no possibility for it to do what Bear Stearns Stornstein tried to do, it to do what Lehman Brothers tried to do in 2008. There was no time. And, and my understanding of it, which could be flawed, is that the reason why it didn't get any time to even make an attempt to save itself was because of a tweet, one single tweet from one of the granddaddies of Silicon Valley, Peter Thiel, uh, who uh, you know has owned stocks in some superstar companies, including PayPal. So he was part of what is known as the PayPal mafia along with Elon Musk. But a single tweet from him indicating that the money was not safe mean that the bank never even had to Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, but it never had a shot because it took basically hours for the bank to fail. Now, the, the good news is, while this is an objective lesson to us on how quickly things can change, the multifamily industry moves in years, so we have more time. But even then, I think that the ticking time bomb, the ticks are getting louder. And to me, they seem like the ticks are getting shorter. And so I did something very recently. Before I answer your question, I think that the, the, there's some foundational work here. So mm -hmm. Sean, was, you were in the audience. So I go to what I consider to be the most respected um, conference in the syndication industry. I, I presented about a dozen of them. But of those, I feel like whenever I go to the best ever conference, and usually is in Denver, this time it was in Salt Lake, the, the quality of the people that show up there is the highest, maybe not necessarily the quantity. Um, and while there's one larger conference in the industry called the NMHC, that conference is really for the big dogs, not for the syndicators. It, it, you know, the syndicators don't get any airtime at all. So from a syndication perspective, the best ever conference is the best conference in the industry from my perspective. I agree. And, and when, I, when I went there, I was supposed to do some real estate trends, market analysis sort of presentation. I completed it, it was 40 slides. I put a lot of work into it. I sent it to them and said, I don't wanna present this because I feel like the industry needs a wake up because of that ticking time bomb that you're talking about. So I go up there, I'm on stage, I'm talking, I'm telling people a bunch of things that they don't know about, even though they're syndicators managing billions of dollars of portfolio, they're missing some very critical information. So I deliver that in 30 minutes and I come out of the conference room and something strange happens. Sean, 
I got mobbed by people saying, demanding, not saying, demanding that I provide a copy of my presentation immediately. And I said, you know, I'm a presenter here at this conference. You'll get a copy of this. And they're like, when? And I said, you know, roughly four weeks. It takes about four weeks for that. I said, no, we, we need that copy right now. Wow. This wow. Moment, we didn't understand. There was one particular slide that we can discuss why they, they were worried about this. Before we continue, let me take 60 seconds to tell you about Multifamily University. Are you ready to take your real estate investing to the next level? Look no further than Multifamily University. Our comprehensive resources, including guest podcast appearances, educational webinars, the Real Estate Trends Toolkit, and the Location Magic course are all designed to make smart investing easy and accessible. Plus, with no subscriptions, no upsells, you can trust that we're always looking out for your best interests. But don't take our word for it. Check out what our satisfied customer, Carlos M., had to say. Neil's presentation was filled with invaluable information that is not readily available to the average investor. This group takes you to the elite level of investing. Join the ranks of the elite with Multifamily University. Join us at multifamilyu.com and start investing from a place of knowledge today. Not only will you have access to a wealth of knowledge from industry experts, but you'll also be able to stay ahead of the game with our in-depth analysis of market trends and potential recessions or corrections. Invest with confidence and make informed decisions based on data, not gut feel. Don't miss out. Visit us at multifamilyu.com today. Or click the link in the description below. And now, back to the content. We didn't understand the risk that we were putting ourselves into and our investors into until now. And so I've been basically forwarding copies of the, the deck to massive numbers of people since then. And they were panicked. So just simply like sending me text messages every few hours because they finally understood the consequences for themselves and for their investors. And while they may have been somewhat aware of these consequences, uh, you could you could hear a pin drop in the audience at several points in the presentation. There was just this feeling of of dread. And all of this is tied back to when did the clock start ticking? Well, first half of 2020, nothing much happens because of COVID. Second half of 2020, the market's loosening up. And so a bunch of people are buying properties and they've got two-year bridge loans, which basically are just in, in sometime in 2022. And then they've got a one-year extension. Right. So these are pretty common, right? Two year bridge loans, one year mm -hmm. extension. Those are pretty common. So now what has happened is that those two year bridge loans have already gone through that extension last year Oof. and are in that. in the, So they're in the middle period, middle of that extension. And a lot of those extensions start to expire in Q3 next this year. So, you know, starting July. So somebody who bought a property in July 2020 with all of the free COVID money, right, that was available to them at that point. They're here now. You, before you say, yeah, but some of these you have further extensions. Read the, the. I said this in my presentation. Banks are not obliged to execute these extensions. You have to agree. They have to agree. Both parties have to agree beyond the first extension. I think the first extension you always get, but the second one you don't get. And so the vast majority of banks that I know of are not planning to allow those extensions. Wow. And so if you don't have an extension, then it doesn't matter if you have a rate cap or not. It doesn't matter how well your property is doing. It could be 20% above net operating income. It could be 30% above its NOI. It doesn't matter because that bank at that point in time wants to yank your loan. And if they yank your loan, you basically only have two choices left, just two. And we're about to have thousands of properties in the United States have just these two choices. Number one, sell your property, most likely at a loss because cap rates have now moved by 125 basis points. And by July, they'll have probably moved 150 basis points. So you can't really sell it um, at any kind of profit. You're going to sell it at a loss and your investors are going to take some sort of haircut all the way up to 100%. The second option is to find someone external that comes and gives you a three to $8 million check and with the help of that check, you're able to refinance into permanent debt. So permanent debt requires more equity injected into just about every property that exists out there today. And if you're able to achieve that, then you go from losing money to making money in one day on the day of refinance. You go from being a cash losing property to a cash flowing property, but now you've massively, irrevocably diluted your investors. 
those two options are going to start triggering starting July. And I think the peak of the, of the problem is at the end of this year. And then it starts, so it starts, starts to burn down because I do expect that the, the Fed will start to cut interest rates next year when interest rates get cut, spreads get you know shrunk. So the, there are solutions to this problem in the second half of 2024, but not in the first half of 2024, and definitely not in the second half of 2023. So, so that, now I've that, sort of laid it out for you. Yeah, that's all been laid out perfectly. And this is going to be a good segue into your rescue fund because that's a, precisely what you're going to be providing people. But before I get to that, obviously it, in 2020 and 2021, cap rates went to historic lows pretty much across the country. I mean, I was seeing them in the twos in San Diego and uh, where we bought. Yeah, twos. 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 Oh my God. Yeah. And and in we own assets in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we bought at a five, five and a quarter cap. Um, and those that, that market shrank down to a four cap, which is insane because Greensboro, North Carolina is not a four cap market. Um, no, not at all. I mean, so you're, you're looking at true tertiaries, right? Not the best, fastest growing tertiaries either. Yeah. To, to see four caps. Uh, I just don't understand it. And I don't want to add one thing in case people are wondering at this point. My contemporaries in the industry in that time frame that I just presented to you, on average, bought eight properties. I bought one because I, as a data scientist, I could not understand. I simply was so many millions away that it actually made no sense for me to engage. So I did other things like industrial and you know self-storage and whatever made more sense to me that wasn't three cap. Um, but I, 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 I refused to engage. I did buy one property, but it was in a very unusual property and was in a, like a true tertiary metro that no one else was paying attention to. Otherwise, I would have lost that one as well. Yeah, I mean, same. honestly, same here. Now, granted, I've been, I have way less experience in this industry than you, uh, but I've been very, very fortunate to have a great mentor, Tony Azar, uh, who's co-GP'd on, on our deals. So he taught me. Uh, when I was underwriting, uh, when he was teaching me how to underwrite, that he likes to do a point or a 25 basis point increase in the cap rate uh, per year that he holds the property. I remember mm -hmm. telling that to people two years ago, a year ago, and we didn't buy any multifamily last year, the year before we had bought in two, and I still haven't bought any uh, yet, purchased any. Um, when I would tell people how- You're we not going to end the year that way, Bishan, because if you didn't buy a bunch of properties, I mean, you, you, that that's a very low risk profile you just described. You're going to buy a bunch of properties this year, but it's not, you know, you have to be patient to get into that second half. And I'll tell you, it's, it, 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 it was difficult and it's still difficult to be patient. And the reason being it's is super everybody difficult. seemed to be making a ton of money. My yeah, everyone around us was just like, I mean, there were companies where, that went from zero to 1.5 billion in this time frame, right? And my question is, right now it feels like they've lost 300, 400 million dollars in value somewhere in that range, wow. right? And and I'm I'm glad I kind of stayed out of it. Now I get to have a rescue fund to come in because my investors saw that I stayed out of it and are more likely to give me money for that rescue fund than than other people are likely to give to anyone else because. The, the investors are about to find out. Mo I would say 95% of all syndication investors in the US haven't gotten the memo yet. I think, you know, it's hard when, I, I mean, I even had investors last year that said, hey, you know, I had this money that was earmarked. I really want to get in and deal with you guys. But, uh, you know, it's been a while. So I, I'm going with this other syndicator. That yeah, actually happened that. to me. And that's really hard because it does make me question myself. Like, man, should we, are we being too conservative? Or, or is anybody else doing Yeah, what deals? am I missing? And then right? I actually had one investor that uh, I was talking to him, told me he had invested in 10 syndications, okay, over the past couple of years. We're one of only two syndications that have actually continued to produce cash flow. He said the rest of them, he hasn't gotten any checks from. So if two out of 10 have cash flowed over the past couple of years, that you know that goes to show you that there's likely 80% of the deals that have gotten done or somewhere around there, if that's common, have not been cash flowing or cash flow negative, like you were describing earlier. It's insane. Yeah, I think the numbers for cash flow negative or substantial cash flow negative should exceed 50% for sure, right? So that you're, you know, and the, the remaining 30% might just sort of drag along the bottom, but not be in trouble enough for the banks to to bother them. Um so yeah, I, I I have a thousand times in the last two years, I've been saying, 
what am I missing? There has to be something big that I'm missing. How can everyone else be buying four properties a year and I'm buying zero properties a year? And so I actually did, you know, mea culpa, adjust our underwriting standards from the 0.25 uh, per year, which you were talking about, you were talking about a quarter cap, to 0.1. And we still couldn't at 0.1 more there, we, we didn't get into best and final any deal. And then I just sort of tuned myself out of the whole thing for about a year, year and a half. And I said, I, you know, I just don't have the ability to understand what these people are trying to do. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that I, I feel so bad for a lot of investors out there that are going to be experiencing this pain. And it's, I, I'm wondering if it's even going to hurt this industry because so many people have ballooned up to these billion dollar portfolios. A lot of those investors may never invest in a syndication again. Um, and it just seemed like every podcast I listened to, somebody was like, yeah, we took down 700 doors this year. We took down this many doors. And I will be honest. There were times where I questioned my mentor thinking like, is he just an older guy that's already made his money? So he's not as worried about it. And he's not as aggressive as we are. And over time, he's proven to be correct. He's been in this industry for a long time. And he was 100% right that a lot of these guys out there have really crappy underwriting. And, and here we are. So tell us now, Neil, about this, uh, this rescue fund. Explain what the idea behind this is to the, to the listeners, because it's such an interesting concept. So there's two kinds of properties that are negative cash flow. There's properties that are at or above net operating income targets and properties that are below net operating income targets. A substantial percentage are at NOI. Why? Because the part that people got wrong was related to interest rates, interest rate caps and cap rates right? Or cap rate compression or decompression, I should say. Mm -hmm. The part that they got right was the property itself. And, you know, in many parts of the US, rents have gone completely berserk. They're at this point flat, and I'm sure they'll be fairly negative for the rest of this year. But when I say fairly negative, they might go down 2%. And you might say, just 2% doesn't sound right. No, because inflation currently, and, and today is a day when the uh, CPI report came out this morning, inflation still at 6%. So if rents are negative two, then they're actually negative eight. Wow. 6% of inflation yeah. plus minus two, they're actually negative eight. So when I say negative two, people think it's not a lot. No, it's a lot, it's a lot. Rent growth in the United States always tracks above inflation. If you take any five-year period and there's 10% inflation in that period, you'll see rent growth at 11 or 12. So it's always tracking above inflation. Right now I'm talking about it being negative, which means it's with huge inflation, we're seeing a minus eight, minus 9% rent growth. So understand how big a deal negative 2% rent, rent growth is. So I don't expect much rent growth this year. It might even be positive. There, all of the uh, uh, analysts are saying rent growth is going to be positive this year, but might be negative in superstar cities, you know, Austin, Phoenix, and, you know, basically the cities that did really, really well and had huge rent growth, they might see that negative two, negative three, whereas other cities that didn't go up like that crazy, like Cleveland or Oklahoma City, I think we're likely to see positive rent growth, though probably not at 6%. So from an inflationary perspective, we still have net negative rent growth, even in those markets that see four or 5% because inflation's at six. So when I look at these properties, I'm not really interested in the properties that are underperforming on NOI, on net operating income. Why? Because with the rent growth being so strong until about six months ago, if you're underperforming, maybe you just didn't pick a good property. Maybe you did, but I'm not interested in having that conversation with you. But what if about this property that is performing at net operating income? And you might say, how is it bleeding? Well, because when they underwrote it, they didn't underwrite it for 9% interest rates and they're they a either they don't they didn't buy a rate cap or you because banks don't force you to buy one they tell you to buy one but you you still have to you know make that purchase yourself so some people didn't buy it or they bought a rate cap but that rate cap is set to 8.6%. Well you, you can have a rate cap and still bleed at 8.6% based on how you underwrote. So now you have a property where if you think about it, it has one or two years of a track record that's pretty perfect. It's meeting net operating income. It's doing what you told it to do. It, the business plan is working, right? Mm -hmm. But you're now at the point 
where the bank has chosen to let you know that we're not going to refinance this property, right? Because the bank is reduced, looking to reduce its exposure because every bank is rattled by what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and they're looking to reduce exposure. Over the next six months, you'll see the banking system shrink because they want to reduce exposure to, to mortgage bonds because you, you, you realize one of the things that just happened with SBB and is likely to happen with other banks is that their exposure to mortgage bonds, those bonds now have to be written down. When a bank writes down the value of its assets, it can lend out next money. So the bank starts to shrink. And when a bank starts to shrink, one tweet from somebody like Peter Thiel can bring them down. So the banks are going to want to reduce their exposure to mortgage bonds, right? And we, we need that more, those mortgages. And so we are going to have many bonds, many banks that could have made the decision to extend our loans that are going to choose to not extend because it's their decision. That well, when that sense. happens, when that happens, we're going to have an extraordinarily bizarre one-time occurrence. I do not believe this will happen again, by the way, in our lifetimes. We are going to have properties meeting net operating incomes or exceeding net operating incomes that are not going to get refinanced. And, and they can't get refinanced to perm debt anyway because the value of those properties has dropped. So maybe you bought them at $40 million and now the value is 35. So there's a $5 million gap. So right? it'd be like a cash in refinance. To do, right. So what you're doing, the, the only thing that you can do, whatever that gap is between 35 and 40. So now you can go to perm refinancing. Because the moment you go to perm refinancing, if the property is performing at net operating income, it should be cash flowing. It should be making money, right? So fundamentally, this is the concept. It's as simple as that. Now you have to apply it across thousands of properties. My current hit rate is one in 20 properties that I'm seeing matches this criteria. The remaining 19 are under NOI by, by some amount. And so I'm not particularly interested in them unless I have extraordinarily draconian uh, rules. When I, when I mean, what do, I, what do I mean by draconian? Basically, I'm just writing down the existing equity and coming in and wiping everyone else out. I, I don't think that this is something that I, I desire to do. I don't, need, I don't want the Wall Street vulture reputation. So mm -hmm. I'll ju I just leave those properties alone. I don't make those offers. I can. I, I know Wall Street people are going to make those offers. And I know that some syndicators will take it so that their career is not destroyed. I don't want to be that guy, right? Yeah. I want to come into properties that are at or above NOI. So when I come in, I'm not wiping out existing investor equity completely. It's, it's going to reduce. And I can give you examples of that. But that's what a rescue fund does. It brings in a check equivalent to the gap needed by Freddie Mac, at this point, they're the more, more aggressive, to refinance the property into perm debt. And when I do that, the money that I bring in takes all of the cash flow and takes a preferential equity position within the property. So until we are paid out our money, let's call it 20%, it depends on the property, by the way. There's, there's no, this is not like the, the underwriting that your mentor taught you, which you can apply to a thousand different properties of any size, any kind, you can apply it, right? Mm -hmm. This is not like that. Every property is different because all of them were purchased at different cap rates, have different NOIs. So the, a formula is something that we're still struggling to evolve. We're still trying to figure out which of these properties we're actually interested in, right? So my first rule of thumb is, would I have bought this property uh, knowing where it is? If the answer is yes, then I'd look deeper into it. If the answer is no, then why would I buy it now, right? I wouldn't have bought it in the first place. It hasn't performed. And so 19 out of 20 are like that. So I think that the rescue funds are going to basically bail out 10% of these properties. The remaining 90% will be sold at a loss. So I'm gonna go back to a question you asked me very early in this interview. You said, do you foresee a lot of properties going back to the bank? The answer is yes and no. Out of those 20 properties, roughly eight, the only recourse that exists is going back to the bank. I, I did a humorous thing on stage and people laughed. At, and I said, if Jesus had a rescue fund, he wouldn't rescue these eight properties because there's no equity in them whatsoever. Yeah. Every single dollar of those investors' money has already been lost. They, don't, they just don't know it yet. It's already been lost, right? And unless cap rates spectacularly decompress in the next six months, that money is going to remain lost. So there's no benefit of me coming in there and just losing my investor's equity as well. I'm just reducing the bank's loss. So eight out of 20 are like that. And one out of 20 is clearly a, a you know, should be rescued and, and will be rescued by somebody. 
And the remaining 11 are basically in, are going to get sold because there is sufficient equity for them to get sold with a haircut for our, the investors somewhere between 1% and 99% of their equity. Do you think that's where the buying opportunities are going to be? So obviously the rescue funds, one piece of it, but as those properties hit the market, is that an opportunity? Because like, let's say this, they bought this property at a four and a quarter cap and you could pick it up for five and a quarter cap later this year. Is there a belief that there's a high probability that you'll be able to then continue with their business plan and either sell for at or lower than the cap rate you're purchasing at this year? Do, do you anticipate cap rates declining again once the interest rates go down? How do you foresee that playing out? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been saying for a long time that there's nothing magical about cap rates. So, uh, two years ago, I was drinking the Kool-Aid that there was something magical about multifamily. And I was like, you know, well, you know, I, I think that we're special. Demand is too high. Supply is too low, you know, blah, blah, blah. It turned out to not be right. It turned out to be wrong, actually, because it, it turned out that cap rates are simply a factor of interest rates and nothing more. So today, multifamily has even more demand than it did pre-COVID. Why? Because demand for, for, uh, for office has declined. Nobody wants to buy offices in the United States. So the right. that seven, you know, tens of trillions of dollars worth of office, well, that money is going to go somewhere. And the first choice is multifamily. So demand has increased since COVID, but it didn't in any way prevent our prices from declining. It didn't prevent our cap rates from, from decompressing. So cap rates, for the most part, are a factor of interest rates. Now, I, I'm it, it's important to say that they're not the only factor. There are other factors at play here, but let's just say it is the biggest factor without you know, speculating on whether it's 50% or 80%, it's the biggest factor. So as we've seen interest rates go down, we've seen cap rates go up. Now you might see, say, you know, yeah, but interest rates could stay high for an extended period of time. And the answer is, I agree, but let's talk about the word baseline, okay? okay? So what happened in 2021, was that the Fed funds rate fell way below the baseline. The baseline in the United States for the Fed fund rate is 2.25, right? Mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, we went to zero. Now, this gap in between, this 2.25 is an extraordinarily large gap. It's a stunningly large gap, right? Now, where are we today? We're actually here. Instead of being close to baseline, we are at five, and the Fed's going to raise by a quarter points this this next week. So they're going to end up at five, five and a half, uh, whatever that may be, but they're way above baseline, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do expect is that at some point, some point being 12, 18, or 24 months from now, the Fed will return to the baseline, right? Now, okay. will they go back below the baseline? No, that was a bizarre, you know, pandemic driven occurrence, but we will return to the baseline at some point because the structure of our economy is built on the, the Fed funds rate being at or close to the, uh, the baseline 90% of the time. So nine years out of 10, it stays at baseline, right? And sometimes it's slightly above baseline, sometimes slightly below, that's okay. That doesn't really ma matter to cap rates. So at some point, that means that cap rates have to decompress until we hit that baseline. They will never decompress to the threes or the twos unless we have another event of this sort. But they have to compress Mm -hmm. Because their current rate level <laughs> has a lot to do with the fact that the Fed funds rate is at five instead of baseline. So I'm one of those believers that believes that at some point, uh, later than most people think, the cap rates will start to compress again. But I don't think it's going to help any of these properties. They are in distress now. Yeah. And I think what will happen is people like me and you are going to swoop in. Remember, I gave you the example of 20 properties. So one gets rescued. Eight of them end up going back to the bank. Well, they're now available for sale for cheap. So it's not just those eight. The remaining 11 have to go into the market, so they have to be sold. But these eight have to be sold too. So now caps that cannot extend their loans, all of those 19 properties have to be sold. So my final question for you is, are you, going to, are you anticipating buying value-add multifamily properties later this year when you see this start to unfold? Yes, but I'm going to be patient. I've been patient for so long that I the first thing I'm telling myself is wait. Right now, multifamily is a falling knife. Mm -hmm. It's a falling knife. 
and I don't know how to catch falling knives. I want it to hit the ground. I want it to hit the wood. And I want to be sure that it hits the wood because what I've learned from the 2008 crisis is even after you think it's hit the wood, the wood itself moves down. <laughs> That's a good analogy. And it's the true. knife stops falling, but the wood <laughs> itself, the baseline, the foundation itself moves down. So I'm just not in a terrible hurry. I, I think I'll be buying nothing in Q3. I might buy something in Q4 if I can make some absurd offer because one of the key things is how many properties are there in the market, You're right? The absurdness of your offers is totally dependent on the number of properties available for sale. So if people manage to successfully drag this out, through cash calls and by forcing their lenders to give them another an extra extension, then I might not buy anything in Q4 either. In the end, the properties have to be sold. You can only push the can down the road so far. So I think the buying opportunity, if that's what you're angling for, is Q3 of this year, Q4 of this year, Q1 of next year, and Q2 of next year. Now, how if, if you want to time it perfectly, I'd say, Q1 or Q2 of next year is if you want to time it perfectly. Does everybody, you know, really time it perfectly? No, you make offers. Sometimes you feel like you've gotten 5% extra because the buyer really had to move and you're their best bet. And then you're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm getting 5% lower than the market and you take it and I'm no different. That this has been an incredible conversation, Neil. Um, this is insight that few people that we interview are able to produce. I, I want to wrap this up uh, with the final question being: If any of the listeners want to reach out to Neil, want to invest in with Grow Capitus, and these deals are going to be purchasing in Q3, four, and one and two of next year, how can they get in touch with you to do so? It's actually really easy. I'm the only Neil Bawa on the World Wide <laughs> Web, so every good and bad remark is about me. So just type in N-E-A-L space B-A-W-A -A into Google or, or chat GPT and you will find your way either way to me. That's perfect. Thanks, Neil. Guys, if you're a, a fan of Neil like I am, make sure you do reach out to him because he when he does have a deal go live, it's always an awesome project. On behalf of myself, uh, the entire Takeoff Capital and Real Estate Takeoff team, thank you all so much for listening. Neil, we're going to have to have you on again another year from now to bring more insight to our listeners. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you.